Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. So what do we want to look at today are design considerations for the various types of partial dentures. So we run through the class 1, class 2, class 3, and class 4 partials. So when we look at class 1 partials generally, okay, we may have, whether we look at premolar abutments, they'll be in either arch. We may have canine abutments in either arch. Uh, sometimes might we have a premolar, uh, a canine, or a lateral incisor, very rarely to have a lateral incisor as an abutment. So if you look at different types of fulcrum lines, again in your text, page 96 talks about different fulcrum lines, and rather than bore you and go over all that, what you want to look at is there's going to be a fulcrum line axis, or a fulcrum line axis for tissue-directed forces, meaning when people bite down on hard foods. And if we have a free end distal extension partial, we expect the distal extension portion of the partial to be compressed toward the tissue a little bit. Again, the tissue is more compressible than the teeth are intrudable. So if you think of biting down on a tooth in a tooth socket, it's got a periodontal ligament suspending it, so you bite down on a tooth, it literally intrudes in its socket a teeny little bit. So if you've got a class 1 partial that has a bilateral distal extension and you've got bicuspid abutments, when you bite on the partial, the bicuspid abutments intrude a little. And the soft tissue that supports the distal extension basis of the partial also squashes down. So the compressibility of the tissue is several factors, many magnitudes more than the intrudability of the teeth into their socket, which results in a distal tipping a little bit of the partial. So that's your fulcrum line or your primary axis on tissue word directed forces. There's also another fulcrum line that's the retentive fulcrum line. Meaning if you eat sticky foods, you're when you're opening your mouth and if something's sticking to the distal extension aspect of the partial, trying to pull the partial denture away from the tissue. There's also a fulcrum line for that. And that fulcrum line is typically going to pass through the retentive tips of the clasps. So if you have a clasp on either side of the arch and the, the object or that part of the partial denture that's going to resist movement that would try to lift it out of the mouth are the clasps. And where is the retentive aspect of the clasps? It's at the terminal third where they're the most retentive and they go into the undercut. So a line passing through the terminal third of the clasp tips would be the fulcrum line on a force going away from the tissue. So you've got a couple different fulcrum lines, not just the one going toward the tissue, but another fulcrum line for forces trying to take the partial away from the tissue. This has gone over extremely thoroughly in the chart on page 96. Indirect retention. What happens with indirect retention is when you have a partial denture framework, that are, the finished partial denture that's trying to be taken away from the tissue, You've got your primary fulcrum line for retention, and then the indirect retainer helps brace the base. Now, the biggest purpose for a third point of reference or indirect retention on distal extension partials comes into play when we are doing relines of the partials. So if you have a patient in for a, for a periodic recall, how many people have had a patient in for just a checkup? You're doing a prophy on them, and you're going to go ahead and check them up and they've either got a combination case that is denture versus a partial denture or they've got a partial denture in one or both arches. So how many people have had a patient like that in just to do a follow-up? Three of you? I mean, a third of you? So the point is what do you look at when we say evaluate their partial? So how do you evaluate partial? You know, <laughs> how's it doing? Okay, good. Did you evaluate the partial? Yep. How'd you do that? I asked Mrs. McGillicuddy if it was doing okay. What'd she say? She said it was fine. Did you do anything else? Ugh. And so one of the things that one would do in a distal extension partial is how would you determine whether or not a distal extension partial might benefit from a reline? 
One of the things was PIP, a simpler way is if we know when the framework was constructed, let's say for the sake of argument, that the lower partial denture was done so that the teeth we had for this lower partial that you're imagining is we had first bicuspid through first bicuspid left in the patient. So we made a lower partial denture framework and we made a lingual plate on it. So we had an occlusal rest and we had a clasp on each of the first bicuspids and we had a lingual plate that went around the lingual aspect of the rest of the front teeth. So if I would say, how do you know if the partial denture needs a reline or not? Just try to make it go teeter-totter across the primary fulcrum line. Can you see that if you take one finger, a gloved hand of course, and hold the, the lingual plate against the teeth, and put another finger on the first molar area of the partial and see if you can teeter-totter it front to back? Everybody with me now? And if, if you can see the lingual plate area that's on the lingual of the anterior teeth noticeably lift up off the teeth. So when you push down on the first molar area, you can see that the back end of the partial tilts down. And then that part of the partial framework that fit against the lingual aspect of the lower anterior teeth lifts up in the air and comes up away from the teeth. Can you see the only thing that can cause that? is if the gum tissue on the underside of the distal extension base has remodeled, has resorbed and reshaped itself. So the gums under the distal extension base don't fit up under the partial as good as they did when it was first made. So when a brand new partial is put in, and you look at it and you see if it'll teeter-totter front to back, if it's bilateral distal extension, you don't expect to see a lot of this tipping back and forth on a new partial over time, a year, two, three, four, what's going to happen is the soft tissue is going to remodel a little bit. So when you go to do that same pushing back and forth, the tissue isn't supporting the back end of the partial. It goes down and your indirect retainer is your point of reference because if that lifts up off the teeth, it's telling you that you've got teeter-tottering. Question. Uh-huh. Teeter totters a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, the question was if you have a class three partial, that's hypothetically tooth supported at all four corners. So there is no distal extension. And at least according to the record, as much as we can believe the record, the the provider at the time said things fit well and everything was okay at the time it was delivered. You now are the poor sucker who's doing the recall a year later and you're cleaning their teeth or you're doing whatever and you try this class 3 partial denture in and it seems like it rocks quite a bit. It just doesn't fit on the teeth very well. We'll go over class 3's in a little bit here but if, a, if basically your partial denture is tooth supported all the way around would any change in the soft tissue, okay, if the gums reshaped a little bit, would that in theory have an effect on the fit of a class 3 partial? Nothing to do with it because it's tooth supported all the way around. Now typically, if a patient is being compliant, I'll say that again, if, underline three times, if a patient is being compliant, and wearing their partial on a regular basis, would you expect that the partial denture framework fitting on the teeth will help stabilize the teeth in that position when the partial's delivered, if in fact things fit well, which they said it did in the record? Is that a reasonable assumption? So if the patient fits like socks on a rooster or something really bad, okay, when you eliminate the impossible, everything left, however improbable, is probably the cause. So the patient was either non-compliant and didn't wear it, which allowed the teeth to shift. It's sort of like I don't know how many of you have undergone orthodontics. And for those of you that did orthodontics, did you wear retainers for some period of time? And if you got lazy because you're just a human being and you went several days or a couple of weeks without wearing your retainer, when you put your retainer back in, it felt like it didn't fit so good. It fit pretty bad, in fact. 
And just after a day or two, things seemed to settle in, and the teeth readjusted themselves to fit your retainer. Same thing happens with a partial denture. So if I have a situation like you have, I either assume one of two things. The patient was non-compliant and didn't wear their partial for some period of time. It's been in the dresser drawer most of the time, and they put it in for when they came in to see you, so now it's your fault because it doesn't fit. Or they dropped it. Or the dog got a hold of it. Because patients lie. You know, it's all my fault. Doc. You know, you're stopped, by the, you're stopped by the cop. So you see the gum machine come out in your rearview mirror, right? So what's the first words out of his mouth? Do you know how fast you were going, ma'am? Do you know how? No, officer. I didn't have any idea. I'm the Virgin Mary here. What happened? You know, so it's sort of like people are not the best at saying, I was doing 20 over. I'm in a hurry. It's my fault. Put the cuffs on me. It's all my fault. Probably if you said that, that you could blow the officer over with a feather and they'd let you off with a warning just because they'd be so blown away that somebody was just upright honest with them. So to answer your question, my greatest suspicion in that circumstance is they were either non-compliant with wearing the parcel and the teeth shifted or they dropped it and it got bent. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Did, did the, uh, the tooth in question that had this sort of a minuscule rest seat on one tooth, did it have any buckle or lingual bracing on the tooth? Or that was the, okay, so the point is you can have somewhat of a minuscule rest seat, but if there's some sort of a retentive arm or a bracing arm or a clasp arm on the buckle and lingual of the tooth, it's unlikely that it's going to shift that much if it's being worn on a moderately regular basis. Mm -mm. Again, if the, two, if the partial's being worn on a fairly regular basis, if they're not wearing it, absolutely, it's going to probably keep tilting over measly. But if the partial's in place, it runs slam into the proximal plate on the partial. So even if the occlusal rest were to break off, you might get a little tissue irritation around that tooth because the, in that area, the partial would be free to, see what I'm saying, slide up and down sort of around the tooth. But because of the proximal plate on the partial, the tooth would have a heck of a time tilting over more mesially if the partial was being worn. So again, when I see those kinds of things, especially with an all-tooth supported partial, the for, and with students, because again, they push you all over the place. I can't tell you how many years it's been. That's one advantage in dentistry of getting gray hair. Okay, I can't tell you how many times over the years I come into the cubicle and I tell the patient verbatim exactly what you just told them six minutes before I got there. And they're going, yes, doctor, okay, doctor, yeah, uh-huh, okay, doctor. And then they leave. And then you come up to me after clinic and you go, I want to send that person to the moon because I said exactly the same thing you did. And they said, are you sure? I, I don't agree with you, da-da this, da-da that. So when you get more gray hair, they just sort of tend to, and you say the same thing, they just don't fight back as much or push back as much. But many times also, if you, it's sort of like the uh, <clears throat> DNA on the dress, you sort of deny, 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 right up until there's incontrovertible proof to the contrary, right? And so if you ask the person, were you wearing this? Oh, yes, yes, of course. And we don't have the DNA on the dress, so to speak, to sort of make people change their story. But that's another matter. So if we look at a class one partial here, basically, what's a fairly common circumstance of a class one partial? You've got a bilateral distal extension. You've got primary retainers in this case bicuspids. This happens to be a lingual bar, not a lingual plate, so we have an indirect retainer here. Again, if we imagine our primary fulcrum line here, we imagine sticky foods, a, a milk dud or a jujube or a gummy bear sticking here trying to lift this away from the tissue, the fulcrum line is going to be through the cut or through the clasp tips and by fact of this touching the indirect retainer or if I have a lingual plate and the lingual plate touches the lingual of all the anterior teeth that's going to resist the back end of this thing tipping up in the air. But as are more important than that because really if anybody eats gummy bears with these they're coming out of their mouth in their lap anyway. They don't stay in that tight. The biggest reason and the biggest advantage of having indirect retainers is an indexing position for the partial to determine whether it needs a reline and then if you, choose, if you say, gee, it does need a reline, how are we going to do the reline on a partial? Unlike a complete denture, unlike a complete denture, 
for a partial denture, what you are not going to do is you're not going to load up the underside of these bases with a little bit of PVS, seat it in the mouth, and just tell the patient to bite together. You're not going to do that. How come? Can you see that over time, if the partial denture base settled down a little bit because it lost tissue support, it's very possible that the opposing teeth, if they were natural teeth, extruded a little bit. So if you just let them bite down, they'll just tilt it to the same orientation it had. So if you go ahead and put your PVS in the underside of the bases, seat the partial denture framework in, and carefully hold firmly the partial denture framework so that the primary occlusal rests are down and the indirect retainers down. If it's a lingual plate, you hold it so that you're sure that that lingual plate fits down and tight against the teeth. So you're holding the framework in its proper orientation to the teeth, which is essentially just suspending the free end of the partial in space over the top of the gums, and your impression material is making up the difference, retreading a tire. People get that okay? You send it off to the lab, the lab relines it. So now it comes back, it's got new plastic under it. You fit it in the patient's mouth, you ask him to bite down. What do you expect to see concerning the occlusion? It's too high in the back. So then you just adjust the occlusion on the partial as necessary to get it so that now the partial doesn't rock front to back. The bite's even but we may have adjusted the occlusion on the partial a little bit because if in fact the distal aspect of the partial sank down because of loss of support where the tissue changed, it's reasonable to assume that the occlusion of the opposing arch followed it down, which is why you don't just have the patient, quote, bite together when you're relining a partial. You orient the framework correctly to the teeth. And that's where the indirect retainers come in as a really good third point of reference for situating the framework on the teeth and knowing it's well seated. It's also a great, as I said, it's a great device for telling whether the partial denture is rocking. Has it lost base support? Easiest way to tell us to see it is a teeter totter. So you look at, here's an uppercase. Now you don't see that much tissue change over time with maxillary partials. They've got a lot more real estate to cover. There's a lot more square millimeters of gums to support them. This whole area across the center of the palate, okay, is pretty good support. So I don't see the need to reline maxillary partials anywhere near the rate at which we need to reline free end mandibular partials because we've got a lot more tissue support for upper partials. And here just shows one in the mouth. So you basically you've got your indirect retainer, you've got your lingual bar, and you've got your clasps. And so you check things out and see, do things rock? Here's a lower, what we've got canine abutments. Now in this particular case, can you see looking straight down on the top of the canines that we have built We've done crowns on them both, and we've created raised cingula on the two crowns. Because again, on the lingual of a cuspid, as it normally exists, it's just that slope that goes all the way down to the gums. There's not a good vertical resting spot. So if the tooth does not otherwise need a crown, you can build that lingual aspect up with composite to create a ledge on the lingual of it in composite. You can also go to the thickest portion of the canine the very thickest portion down on the cingulum, take a parallel sided flat ended burr and cut a small ledge, a fairly narrow ledge, or you can build it up with composite, any of the three. My main goal isn't to leap immediately to doing crowns on teeth if they don't otherwise need a crown other than for creating a resting spot. You can do that other ways. Sometimes when canines are rotated, we'll actually put a small little notch on the incisal edge of the canine so that this framework fits on that little notch. Canines are rotated a bit. That does not wind up being aesthetically unpleasing. Now many times we would not use incisal hooks if we thought this was going to show very much. 
rather than use this, my own prejudice would be, if I could, to try to use a little bit of a ledge down on the cingulum at the lingual. When we look at canine abutments in the maxilla, as much as I possibly can, what I try to do in the maxillary arch is avoid this if I can. Because again, one of the biggest complaints patients are going to have about partial dentures in general, removable partial dentures, is actually two things. One, they come in and out. Can you give me anything that's fixed that doesn't come in and out? Well, depending on the number and distribution of teeth, you may not have that choice. So one big complaint, gee, they come in and out. Second biggest complaint is they're ugly. I don't like that big clasp showing on my tooth, which is why any time, and I mean any time, you get a maxillary partial denture in which you're going to have a canine as an abutment, try to survey it in such a way if this is the canine, and this is the front of the mouth here, try to work things in such a way that you see if you can come down with an infrabulge clasp arcing toward the distal. So this is the greatest convexity of the tooth. If you look at this from the incisal edge, cuspid teeth or canine teeth, when you look at them from the incisal, have two faces. They're sort of a distal face and a mesial face, and it sort of comes around like this. And if this is the front of the mouth, anything you can get from here back tends to hide. So the cheek is hiding it a little bit. If you can create an infrabulge class with a modified T or an I at the distal labial aspect of the tooth, close to, as close to the gums as you can get it. Again, when you're surveying these casts, the whole idea about trying to reshape the labial aspect of the tooth to get the height of contour as low as you can toward the gums. I'd like my ten thousandths of an inch of undercut to happen ideally about 0.5 millimeters from the gums. Because can you see the closer you get your clasp to the gums, two things happen. One is it's better mechanically because you're grabbing closer to where the tooth comes out of the bone. But secondarily, it's just nicer looking aesthetically. Because on an upper case, if the clasp is way up toward the gum, depending on where the patient smiles, their lip doesn't come up above the clasp, so you don't see it. And if you're hiding it around the distal labial of the tooth, you don't see it. So over the years, I just see lots and lots of partials on maxillary cases where there's a canine involved that, as far as I'm concerned, are just but ugly. Because somebody didn't take the time to take a study model and survey the darn thing and see where is the height of contour. Can I come up with a survey that will, that will give me a height of contour that tries to be at the distal labial? And then I try to get a good enough impression so I hope that I don't have a lot of undercut of soft tissues to contend with up deeper in the vestibule from where I want to come down on that tooth. Because if I've got real severe undercut up in the soft tissue in that area, then it's difficult to do an infrabulge clasp. But on maxillary partials, wherever there's a cuspid involved, I really like to do an infrabulge clasp if I can at all, and that's what's drawn here. The thing I would change on the drawing is I would not take it to the mid-labial. I would take it to the distal labial, sneaking it around this back corner. Now, if I do that, one of the other principles I've got to do is I've got to grab around that tooth more than 180 degrees so the tooth doesn't move over time away from the partial denture framework. So that means I need to get some aspect of my framework as far up around that mesiolingual, as far up there as I possibly can. So if my clasping is at the distal labial, I need to get my indirect retention or my occlusal rest or something as far around the corner, around the mesiolingual as I can, so I get more than 180 degrees of encirclement of the tooth, so it doesn't move over time. And so here's some other cases where we'll do these. This is starting to get to the right idea, but it's sort of like if we carried it clear over to the mesiolabial corner and then went back, right idea, but it's sort of like, hmm, screwed that one up a little bit. 
because if we were doing this anyway, why didn't we just come down, arc up a little further, and have the anterior most aspect of that T-bar be just about mid-labial on the cusp, but, or a little bit distal to mid-labial. So my clasp engaging was right here, because this, when the patient smiles, just jumps right out at you. It's sort of like this chrome hubcap looking at you when they drive by. Pretty, who did that for you? Dr. Shot, well, I'll be sure to tell all my friends about that. That's great. And if you have a modification space, same thing here. You've got your class one, because it's bilateral distal extension, happens to have an anterior modification space. Class twos, okay, what do we got? Class two is a unilateral free end, upper or lower. So what have we got here? Basically, you've got your primary occlusal rest, your primary occlusal rest, your indirect retainer. Your fulcrum line runs through the occlusal rest if we're talking about the fulcrum line that is concerned with tissue word movement. If you bite down on food in this area and you try to push this down, your fulcrum line runs across these occlusal rests. Your retentive fulcrum line, if sticky foods are trying to lift the partial away from the tissue, is going to go through the retentive tips of this clasp and this clasp. So this is your fulcrum line if it's for occlusal word forces. If it's for sticky forces trying to remove the partial and the retentive fulcrum line goes from the tip of the cusp, or I'm sorry, the tip of the clasp to the tip of the clasp. So that would be the removal fulcrum line. Class two upper, same kind of a thing. You've got a unilateral distal extension. Okay, we've basically up here got our primary retainer our primary retainer, indirect retainer, third point of reference. Here again, they happen to put a T-bar clasp on this. What I would do a lot of times, if I could take a high-speed handpiece or a carborandum disc, if I had a reasonable retentive contour at this distal labial aspect, I'd try to recontour this and cut this part off. Again, the curvature of this infrabulge aspect, if I can get that to come down a little bit distal to the point of greatest convexity, I hide the whole thing better. Now with a lot of these patients, when you're assessing the patient and you're thinking about what you might be doing for clasp design on any of these patients, male or female, when they're in and you take your preliminary impressions, one of the things to do with the patients is just get them so they moisten their lips, lips are nice and relaxed, you ask them to smile. And then you ask them to put a really fakey smile on that's so hard it's going to break their face and see how high they can really fakey smile. And you may get some people that even on the fakey smile, their lip doesn't get up far enough so that that's an issue. But that's useful information. That's useful information. Because if a person has a really high smile line, then you want to do anything you can to try to hide or diminish how obvious the clasp is. And to that end, it's going to work out better if you survey these things and be looking real hard for retention at the distal labial aspect of the tooth. Hope that you do not see a frenum attachment coming right in there or a big soft tissue undercut. Soft tissue undercuts bother me more than frenum attachments. If aesthetics is a big deal, the patient can't afford a precision attachment of some sort, and I got a frenum in there, what do you suppose I'm going to do? I'm going to call up my friendly neighborhood periodontist, or if you do it yourself, and I'm going to do a phrenectomy. I'm just going to cut it out of the way. So I can put my clasp where it will be aesthetically the most pleasing, and I'll just lose the freedom at that point. If there's a huge soft tissue undercut, that's a little more difficult to deal with. But if it's a freedom that's in the way, you can consider doing a phrenectomy to maximize the aesthetics of your clasp. Okay, a, two, a class two, we've got a modification space, an either front or a back modification space. So here's your class two, unilateral distal extension. And there's another spot that's edential that's over here, but bounded by teeth. So we have a distal abutment here. So this would be a class two P. Okay, and so here basically is the framework of that, which shows you the posterior modification space. There's the posterior modification space when we're getting ready to take a bite on it. Same kind of a thing in the mouth. Okay, here's our class two, posterior modification space with the molar. Primary occlusal unit, our primary uh, occlusal retentive unit, 
Another one over here, primary retainer. I mean, that's the word I'm grasping for is a retainer, which consists of an occlusal rest, a retentive arm, and a reciprocal component. Either that's going to be a lingual reciprocal arm, or it's going to be a lingual plate that goes across the lingual of the tooth. So we have occlusal rest, clasp component, and reciprocation component. Okay? So you can have also a class two. Here's your distal extension, free end, and we got both an anterior and a posterior modification space on this. So again, it's still a class two, happens to have two modification spaces. And so here's that case in the mouth. Combination case, you got an upper denture, you got your lower partial, you got your free end side with the clasp, okay? We've got some modification spaces, and then over on the other side. Here's the same thing in a maxillary case. Again here, we've tried to make more use. These were done several years ago when we took these pictures. And over time, what we've tried to do with these eye bars is I tend to like a modified T-bar rather than an I-bar. And the reason I like a modified T-bar rather than an I-bar is it just has it has a bigger footprint. It touches more tooth than this. And again, if I can try to hide this around the back corner of the tooth, I don't think I pay an aesthetic price for that. But it used to be one of our former faculty loved doing these, and he would, he would try to make these things like jewelry. So they really got, so they were really fine, barely showed up at all. What do you suppose the downside of that was? That they didn't necessarily break, they just came out of retention real quick. So you didn't have a big enough footprint, and this arm that came down just wasn't stiff enough that they were back all the time getting it adjusted, which over time led to what one individual said is they'd break. So if I've got just a slightly more robust arm here, and it doesn't have to be like a truck bumper, okay, on a Kenworth semi going down the road, it doesn't have to be that big, but I find that the little foot going toward the distal just gives me more square millimeters of contact with the tooth, than that little area of the eye bar will. But again, I try not to have this thing come down mid-labial on the tooth. I want it to come down toward the distal labial aspect because it's going to give me a more aesthetic partial. And depending on the patient's smile line, they just don't show up that much. It works out really well. Class threes, which pertain to one of the questions asked earlier. If I've got a class three, hypothetically, I shouldn't have to deal very much with the resorption of the edentulous ridges. So if I've got an area in here or an area in here, when you get to the mouth, both of these areas where they're edentulous are bounded by teeth. So when this person bites down really hard on their partial, they're not squashing the gums because the partial is tooth supported all the way around. So if this was delivered last year, and then you wind up getting the patient 11 or 12 months after this was delivered, and they're telling you it doesn't fit worth the tinker's darn. Again, all you can go by is what's written down in the Form 6. So if the Form 6 says everything fit just peachy at the time it was delivered, and the occlusion was good, and it doesn't fit so good now, my first supposition is the patient either has not been compliant about wearing it, or it got dropped. It got dropped. And in either case, what's going to happen is if the framework gets sprung, you can try to fiddle and fix it, but it's not going to work well. If the partial is not being worn, as was asked before, this distal molar and this distal molar, it's very likely that they may, in fact, be pounded a little more mesially. So that distance from the mesial marginal ridge of this tooth to the distal proximal of this tooth will have decreased a little bit. And if you try to seat the partial down in, it'll seem really, really, really tight because what's happening is your partial denture is now acting like an orthodontic appliance. And you're trying to see if you can get those distal teeth pushed upright again. So depending on how long the patient was non-compliant about wearing it, you may or may not be able to get that much movement. You may or may not. So here's another one. Now, many times people will ask, if I've got a class 3 partial that's completely tooth supported, it's very common that I will tend to use just a metal base with bead retention. Because again, if I've got a completely tooth supported partial, I don't plan on having to reline the underside of that partial. 
because I don't expect the gums are going to change much because I'm not putting much pressure on them, not putting any pressure on them. So where I'm doing basically a completely tooth-supported partial, pretty common that in the edentulous areas I'm just going to put a cast metal base with bead retention. Occasionally we've done this, if I've got a tooth in this area. So here's a tooth that's a partial that's completely tooth supported, but we're laying right over the top of this tooth. And you may or may not be able to see very well sometimes what happens with these teeth is the tooth basically is cut off pretty much at the gum line, and occasionally these will have a post and coping put on them. Now, can anybody imagine a reason why I might have my partial denture just go over the top of that tooth? Any thoughts? Sometimes if you take study models and mount these cases, the tooth in this area sits way up above the plane of occlusion. It's almost in contact with the upper gums. And when you look at it, it's real obvious from the front that this tooth in the back, because it was unopposed for some period of time, extruded. So if you're going to leave that tooth at the height it showed up at, your plane of occlusion on that side in the patient would be going way the heck up in the air, whereupon you've got no room to work on the upper arch. So one of the things you want to do with study models is evaluate the orientation of your plane of occlusion. And in other areas, where do you suppose you learn? Where do you learn how to evaluate the orientation of the plane of occlusion? Where do you learn that? With your denture patients. Yeah? So what's a reasonable plane of occlusion? Even with the anterior teeth to the center of the retromolar pad that you do with the denture. So what happens to students all the time when they get these bigger cases, if there's teeth there, no matter how screwed up or crooked the teeth are with the anatomic landmarks, somehow you people think the teeth came down off Mount Sinai with Moses or something. Oh, they're sacrosanct. Oh, my God, they can't be touched. Oh, we got, how can we possibly work with it, Dr. Shotwell? Because it, uh, uh, uh. well, where's your, where are your anatomic landmarks? So it may be on a tooth like this. In some cases, maybe it was already endodontically treated. And I'm not even thinking about putting a crown on it. I'm going to hose that puppy right off at the gum line. And many times, how many of you have had it, you get a tooth that's the terminal tooth in the lower arch. Very last tooth in the lower arch. What do you often see concerning the gums at the distal marginal ridge of the last tooth in the lower arch? The gums are right up even with the marginal ridge of the tooth. Anybody had one of those? They're fun to do crowns on, aren't they? Because it's real easy to get that nice axial wall on the distal. You people are freaking out, and I say, you know, give me the anesthetic. But they're really profoundly numb, Dr. Shot. Well, I gave them an inferior alveolar. I know they are. Now, was I speaking Klingon or what? Give me the anesthetic. And then I go ahead and I infiltrate the daylights out of this tissue right here until it turns about as white as my lab coat. Because what am I about to do? Rotary gingitage. Okay? We're going to vaporize it. Because I've got to get a hold of that tooth. Or many times, depending on where this is extruded to, it's way above where a reasonable plane of occlusion ought to be. So I'm smoking that puppy down until it's at a reasonable plane of occlusion, just like you would if you were going to adjust the wax rim on a denture. So the denture stuff really does come back to help you even when you've got teeth there. Look at your landmarks. And so the reason one might consider making a partial like this is this side of the mouth is extruded. Tooth perhaps was already endodontically treated. So we cut this puppy right down even below the height of the gums at the distal marginal ridge. We, get it, we smoke that too. And then I put a bevel around this whole thing and all I do is have hog out the whole pulp chamber. So when I get this coping back, this post and coping, it sort of looks like a mushroom with this mushroom stem coming down in the center of it that sort of goes down to where the pulp chamber was. People following me okay? And the occlusal is just a flat occlusal that doesn't try to go much higher than the gums. It just covers the occlusal of the tooth and it goes down to the bevel that I created on it. So now I've got this thing about at the right height or a little below the height of an ideal plane of occlusion. Then I can take my partial and just rest it right over the top of it. I have no intention of putting a tooth on top of this. 
My teeth are going to be up here, but my plane of occlusion will now be even and level. And it won't be going way the heck uphill on the side where the tooth was extruded. So look at some of those things when you're thinking about these. So here's a class three all tooth supported with an anterior modification space. Here's another class three in a maxillary case. So you basically got teeth over here, okay? You can see you just come across the palate. Sometimes you affectionately refer to these things as a closed palate or a toilet seat for obvious reasons. And so you can go ahead and not cover too much of the palate. But the thing here is if you look at this and say, well, why wouldn't I just choose to do that longer span? We'd have three ponics. Can anybody give me some reasons why I might not choose to do that as a fixed partial denture? Why wouldn't I do it as a bridge? Do people feel comfortable about that length of a span? It's getting pretty long. Now you're going ahead and you're putting a crown on a cusp and you're putting a crown on a molar. Again, the thing you do is you remember way back in the depths and the recesses of your brain in Dr. May's lecture, something called Auntie's Law. Anybody vaguely remember what Auntie's Law talked about? Okay, number of square millimeters of root surface in contact with bone. I'm not talking about anatomical root surface. I'm talking about clinical root surface. So if a person has lost some attachment and they've lost some bone height, can you see that they, they still got the same anatomical root surface, but they don't have the same clinical root surface? People follow the difference between those two? So suddenly if you lose bone, your clinical crown gets taller and your clinical root gets shorter. So now you start looking at how many square millimeters of tooth root do I have here and how many millimeters of tooth root do I have here in bone and is that equal to or greater than, preferably greater than, the square millimeters of tooth root of all the teeth that are being replaced, all the pontic teeth. Now the other thing that happens when you have a longer span bridge in the upper or the lower jaw, what do you suppose one of the forces that happens on a fixed partial denture here is that just really beats the periodontium up a lot? It's not straight down vertical forces, it's buccolingual forces. Forces that try to rack this thing buccolingually. And can you see that if you do this with a partial denture, this is what we're talking about when we talk about cross arch stabilization. So the fact that the partial comes over here and gets a good grip on this tooth on the other side of the arch, can you see this is now like a three-legged milk stool? It's pretty stable. So if any forces try to take this side and wiggle it buccolingually, it gets braced off this. So longer span from front to back is not always ideally treated as a fixed partial denture. If you can put implants in there, not a problem. But long span with a fixed partial denture can spell heartache, especially if you ever get a long span and this anterior tooth, and I see it over and over again, is a cuspid that has been endodontically treated and has a post and core in it. So I can't tell you over the years how many of these long span fixed partial dentures I've seen in which the anterior abutment is a cuspid that was endodontically treated, that had a nice cast gold post and core, and a really nice fitting PFM crown. What do you suppose I see happen to these teeth three to ten years down the road? Vertical root fracture. Now we are in the vernacular scrahood because now I no longer have a cuspid to hang on to. I'm up to a lateral incisor. A lot of support there, isn't there? That's a real peach. So now let's do even a longer span bridge using a lateral as our primary abutment. Duh. Well, because the lateral is not too good, let's just pull the lateral and let's splint the two centrals together. Now you're just getting insane. Just don't even come to me with that. Okay, now you're thinking really hard about implants. Or you're thinking really hard about some sort of a partial. So longer spans are not always the best treated with fixed partial dentures because of the buccolingual force that will go on those long span bridges. And the partial can give us cross arch stabilization. So it really helps mitigate the buccolingual forces on those teeth. So basically, here's just another example 
of a class three, tooth supported all the way around. Again, we try to keep getting these things. I'm much happier if they're tucked around the distal labial or the distal buccal corner. Then we get to the class fours. Class fours are always tough because your replacement teeth are always in front. And sometimes these tend to be tippy and it's really hard to get all the tippiness out of these. So over your practicing lives, what you may want to consider is a lot of these class four partial denture cases can really be treated successfully if you can find one spot somewhere under this anterior area to put a single implant. And the advantage of doing it with a partial denture is the location of the implant doesn't have to line up exactly with the tooth. Now, if you're in practice for very long, what you're going to see is some genius that with no planning puts some implants in the anterior area and the location of the implant is exactly in the interproximal embrasure area of where the tooth ought to be. So now how do you get that so it looks pretty when you're trying to put fixed work on it? As they call, it takes restorative ingenuity. It's sort of like, yeah, right, it's called pink porcelain to try to cover up your screw up. Okay, so on these, if you're doing it with a partial denture, you can just put a single implant anywhere across here, put a zest locator on it, and it's going to work really well. Very seldom, to show you this one, it doesn't happen often. If you have one of these people that's got class 3 lower arch, it seems like all the teeth sort of toe in lingually. When you survey it, you can't fit anything on the lingual of the teeth, not very often, but occasionally we will do a labial bar. So all the teeth are leaning so far lingually, we can't fit anything down lingually. So the partial goes out here, and as luck would have it in most of these cases, the lip conceals that pretty well. Most of the time now, would you choose to do that as an implant? Absolutely, you would choose to do it with, as an implant. On these big cases, the more teeth you're replacing up here, the more difficult it is to have these not have that anterior tipping phenomenon. And in your practicing lives, unlike mine, one of the things I would try to be telling anybody with this situation is to try to get a, an implant up here somewhere to brace the anterior aspect to this. Many times with class fours, when they come back for recalls, this is what you see because of that tippiness. You can beat yourself up about this, but you can't always get rid of this. Try as you might. Try as you might. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu/license.